Hi everybody, welcome to the second session of the day. Yeah, no. uh, this room is for magic crazy. <laughs> Disclaimer before you know before it's like too uncomfortable to leave, this is not a mental health uh, presentation. This is primarily a developer focused presentation. Uh, it may help your sanity to know some of these things. Uh, and you know, over where I am here, but it's not a mental health presentation. So if you're feeling like you're uh, being batshit crazy is scripting big government sized things. The thing that probably most of us do at least a few times a year uh, if you're working on a government sized project. Uh, this is uh, basically an audit of that and, and how to go forward uh, with some helpful tools. Uh, my name is Steve Burt. I'm a senior engineer at Civic Actions. Uh, have been on Lots of government, you know, some of the bigger government projects that exist. Uh, I've been on them one point or another. Currently on Center for Medicaid and Medicare. And I'm Richard Burke. I'm also a senior engineer at Civic Actions, working on the VA website for the Veterans Affairs. And prior to that, I was at Penn University in Omaha as director of software engineering. And we're both from Civic Actions, and uh, Civic Actions is a digital services company. We help government deliver better public services through open technology and design. And you'll see on some of our slides our values of balance, openness, and care. And uh, so if you're wondering what those mean, balance is all about knowing and honoring our priorities. Openness is about defaulting to open and care for ourselves, each other, and the world. Some of the organizations and government agencies we work with include the National Science Foundation, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and while well, I'm working on the Veterans Affairs. And we'd like to thank all the sponsors of uh, GovCon. Thanks to these people uh, and, and organizations, this uh, conference is free, so we appreciate all the people who contributed to it. Uh, and you know, so in your head, picture, just pick one name off the list and positive thoughts. Uh, there we go. You could do some actions because it's already on So, uh, what do I cover here? Again, ways to do big government sized things to your content. Uh, scripting to do big things repeatedly, if possible. Uh, we're going to look at one of the best practices for doing big scripty things. And we're going to introduce a tool to dramatically reduce the craziness. So, what are some examples of big operations? We can take some from our VA experience. Uh, we've had to run validation on all of the site content, tens of thousands of nodes, and all of the fields in those nodes, updating all the references in our uh, site to the new national suicide hotline. At some point, it changed from an 800 number to a 988 number, whether it was a field, whether it was a field. It was even we wanted to make sure that all of them were updated. And then replacing all of that external links to a new element. So looking in all of those examples similarly to like all the wizarding self text areas and uh, parsing through all that, making sure that we updated all of those. The one we're going to talk about and refer to today had to do with COVID. So we wanted to get out information about our VA facilities. The VA runs the largest health system in the country. And for that, we wanted to make sure that veterans and their families when they came to the facilities knew what the COVID restrictions were for those facilities. So we rapidly rolled out the ability to send both ways code about the current level, but also some narrative text to describe that. Um, thankfully, we kind of thought ahead. We didn't name those fields COVID. We made them supplemental status. And the thing is that after the COVID emergency was declared over, what we wanted to do was retain those fields, but remove all the data from them and hide them so that should some other national emergency come up that required the use of those fields, 
that we had transcripts available, but we didn't want to have any data that was so old and vestigial. So, we've all been in Drupal probably long enough that we recognize Drupal's complex, right? If we're going to go big match operation, we've got to deal with lots of things that are Drupal-y. Uh, one of which you may or may not have encountered, right? You probably, better off you don't know what, even what the sandbox is in terms of uh, batch operations. Uh, so, you know, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? It's complex enough uh, in, in all of those choices. And what we're going to do through is kind of break down what those choices might look like, but it's complex and we all know that. But first thing we need to figure out is what is it really even that we need to operate on? Uh, are we operating on nodes? Are we operating on terms? Maybe both paragraphs, menus. Uh, it all becomes just a you know cat wrestling game. So, what are the steps for an operation? Um, simply, you want to find out what it is that you need to gather. You know, it can depend on is it a type of uh, content, uh, is it a type of some kind of entity. Uh, then get the next one of that type and do some work on it. Um, and then make sure that you log that process and care about knowing what happened and making sure that your site sort of represents that some action took place. And then keep doing that, pulling each one in and working it. And then at the end of that, we want to present some kind of information about the fact that that process has been completed. Along the way, of course, with this happy path, you may run into errors. You may not allow those errors. You may run into things that stop the process and figure out what to do when you stop that process. But this, this is the simplest version of the path that you want to take. And okay, so you're making these changes. Well, what do you do with revisions? Uh, if you've got a lot of content and a lot of history, you may decide you want to do every single revision because, say for instance, your site is such that like, you have to revisit old revisions and sometimes publish them and bring back old versions of the page. Well, then you definitely want to do every revision. Or you don't worry about that and you just wanted to use the default revision to make the changes to that. Or you're thinking, you know, I have a lot of editors that put things in draft or in review. So I want to make sure that I get not only the default revision, but also any of those revisions that they make subsequent to them that have yet to be published. And so those are the kind of decisions you have to make, the determination you want to figure out before you make these changes. So another question comes up of, you know, <clears throat> what should I log? Right? Do I log every item you watch log? If you've ever done this before, you know that trying to audit watchdog logs and go back and see did I really operate on this one node, it's almost impossible to find. Okay. And so do we want to choose to, to log every item to watchdog? Maybe, depends on the situation, but probably not. Uh, in terms of the size that we've done for things like VA or UCMS, uh, we'll pull out a watchdog log. Like it'll completely like overwhelm everything that's in watchdog, and the only thing that's in there are your log items and maybe only half of those because it, it just runs out because there's usually a limit to how much watchdog can be stored. Do you log your output internal? Um, maybe. <laughs> it may be, but you know, look at that for auditing. Sure, I could probably figure out if I you know did one specific note out of that. Uh, or do I log into a text file? Okay. And you know, this is a perfectly valid approach. And at some point, you've got a bunch of text files that nobody remembers why they're there. Uh, hopefully, you've named them well so that they have some meaning to them, but you end up with a bunch of logs that it's like, I don't remember what this is for. So, in my thinking, there has to be a better way. If I encounter an error, how should I handle it? Right? This is a big operation. Say it runs into a failed error right in the middle of it. Well, if I'm doing it locally, I want it to fail so I can figure out why it failed and fix it. If I'm doing this on production, I don't want it to die, especially if I've made it part of my, my like, deploy pipeline. Uh, so, do I want it to fail while being stopped? Do I want it to fail gracefully and keep going? Do I want it to fail silently and keep dancing like nobody's watching? 
Okay, probably not that last one. Right? Maybe the first two. Maybe you can make a case for, you know, on a case by case basis, either one of those first two options might be the way to go. That's kind of a personal question. Uh, <laughs> that is not the word you think it is. Oh, oh, right. Thank you. Uh, Identifiance. Can it be run more than once, or should it only run once, right? Is it, am I going to damage the content if I run it twice? Again, there's no right answer. It depends on what it is that you're doing. Some cases with batch operations, you can only run one on, on, on a given node or a given element entity once. If you run it a second time, it ends up damaged or it ends up with extra revisions that you didn't need. So uh, we found something that could account for this. So when you do these kinds of operations, you want to figure out who the best person is, who the right role is to run this. And depending on your situation, depending on your organization and your tolerance for risk, it may be only DevOps that's here. Uh, they go into Josh, I'm the terminal to run this sort of thing. Um, it might be a Drupal admin, you know, because they have the necessary knowledge or release manager who is the sort of single point of responsibility. On the other hand, you may want to update all of those decisions and make it a part of your pipeline so that it runs when certain other actions are also running based on your test passing and the pipeline moving forward. And then lastly, of course, you may decide this is the best sort of thing that happens on a schedule. Every week, every day, every quarter, every fourth of July. Uh, and, and because of that, you use something that is going to make it easier for you to sort of set it for health. Now, how should it be run? So this is the sort of thing that when you update the database and you get a schema change you want this to run then or is it after those changes with post update hook um, or maybe after config has already been imported. Um, perhaps it's I want to be able to do it with a custom drush command uh, or with a custom script via drush. Um, again maybe because of the schedule you just want to run it through the primary once in a while. Um, you could use batch API or what if you want a UI and now that opens the possibility of that Drupal admin or something else with the corporate world being able to do it through the website. So if we ask 50 developers the question of how would we do this, we get 50.6 answers out of it. Right? There's not only kind of like we're inconsistent. We're developers, we're not inconsistent, but Different situations require different approaches, and different developers require their own approaches. You never know. Uh, we all have situations, right? There is no right way out of them. Don't do the fail silently and dance like nobody watching. Don't do that. But everything else, all of those were valid possibilities through all of those choices. Have you lived these questions before? Right? Did audience participation? If this has caused you stress before, raise your left hand. Okay. If you actually enjoy the thrill of doing this, raise your right hand. It's perfectly okay to put up both hands. Right. I kind of live for this though. Like I like this. I like the thrill. For me, it was a thrill. But there are also parts that were minutiae painful. Are we gonna let this bring us down? How right. many? You know, princes. So I'm not going to sing it for you for you. Um, no, no, we're not going to ask parents down. We're going to go back to the Right? Right? We're not going to let this bring us down because we're, we're developers. We like inventing stuff new every time. We're Vikings. We have nerves of steel and ice in our veins. And we're Vikings. Vikings. <laughs> Steve, we talked about this. <laughs> we're not Vikings. They're wearing something actually t shirt. Okay, we're not Vikings. We're developers. We're kind of methodical about stuff. That's how we get things done. We're flexible. We're wise. We make good choices based on situational awareness. We don't paint ourselves into corners. We choose good tools if we know about them. We're good stewards of our code base. We don't want to handle the best off to somebody else. 
Uh, we're consistent. We're eccentric in our choices of drinks, but not our choices of COVID. So, we're also people that contribute back to the greater good. So, Christian and I and other developers at Civic Actions have had a history of giving back to Drupal whenever we can, especially when we run into something that can be of help on other projects, either for our own future selves, right? If we contribute it, it's portable, right? We can use it on another government website someplace else to their benefit and save taxpayers dollars, right? So, we contribute to Drupal, that helps the government, some of our government work and contributions have gone on to help people on other projects that might be at the state level, at the county level, whatever. So it's it's good practice. Contribute when you can. And we contribute in a module called code in batch operations. Code in meaning it doesn't do anything completely by itself. You have to add a little code to it. Uh, from the beginning, we got UX involved in this. Now, now think about this, the, the unusualness of this. This is a module for developers, and we got UX involved in the beginning. Well, that doesn't usually happen in the Drupal sphere. Uh, and so we have a team, uh, Blake Morgan and Kelly Smith, up in the upper right hand corner, they're not here today, but uh, they contributed to this, and they wanted us to uh, remind people that even tools built for developers can benefit from installing the UX team. The UI is built using components from the default Drupal Taro uh, uh, theme admin UI design system. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I've been in Drupal for a long time. I didn't know that existed. Uh, there's some links, and the, the links will actually just go out at the end of this slide deck. Uh, and design slash dev collaboration in mind is a, a, a handshake, not a handoff. So they still support this module and ideas as, as we add things to it. So, what is it that coded batch operations does? Here's the bluff, right? Provides organization to the approach. Provides repeatability to a batch approach. Provides flexibility, doesn't pay too many partners. And it blocks the crap out of things. So what it does is it creates a framework for implementing these big operations using two different modules the code and batch operations, which is a main module, and the UI module, which is a sub module. You don't need the UI module, it just makes it easier for, for instance, a Drupal admin to go and run a batch operation themselves if they have their permissions. But the module itself is the one where they put the functionality and all the actual operations of what gets done. So, when you install it and you go to the settings, you have the choice to determine where you want your code to live. And this could be any one of your appropriate um, modules. And, you know, in our case at the VA, we have a VA build backend, right? And this is a bit of a catch all for lots of backend operations. So, when we use this, we're going to put that into the where it says my local mod, it would be our VA go back end. Uh, user ID is the one that's going to be doing these operations. So uh, you can set this as some user that does something consistently for you, perhaps uh, in a, uh, in our case, we have a uh, migrator user. And that's the user ID that we would use for doing this stuff. Or if we wanted to create a specific batch operations user, we would do that. Um, when you do this, you can also enable Con to do these operations for you. Um, if you've already run operations and have logs, this is where you can delete the logs. We'll talk a little bit about permissions around this as well. But, uh, but this is the screen we're going to do now. <laughs> so, what this lets you do is easily create uh, a script to do the operations themselves using the dependency injection of what's already there. And if it's not there, this is a call to arms for folks to, when they use it, provide back functionality that they think it should have, and feel free to do it in the most truly way possible, which is 
contributing. There are a lot of helper modules, or uh, a lot of helper functions. Um, so for instance, getting all those revisions, or getting the default revisions, um, or just getting the latest revision. Um, also, those are all you know, uh, various traits that we have that are been developed for this. Um, giving uh, specific types of nodes. Um, I don't know about you, but we have dozens of types of nodes, and a lot of times all of our, the data we want to operate on is in a specific type of node. Um, and then saving that revision or saving that term if you're making changes to taxonomy. Um, and I agree with that. Okay, so what about the logging itself? So this is like, when we were talking about it with a colleague in civic actions, I think the thing that she said was, this is the most interesting thing about this, so I want to really highlight it, which is your logs are there until you get rid of them in a specific entity. They're not ephemeral anymore. They don't go away when you log out. They don't go away when Watchdog refreshes. They, they're there until you delete them if you run a patch operation. Uh, so anything you log out as a part of that process is there. And, uh, and you can audit it, you can look at it, you can compare it to other logs that you also have that have other ones you've done. Uh, this makes that an incredibly powerful, a great sort of self-documenting tool. So here's an example of a UI. And so you can see what you have here is when the last time it was run, so for example, by expiration, when it was started, um, whether it completed, what the executor was, so if you ran it through the UI, um, and then did it have errors? Um, and you can post some interesting thing here on that uh, third option. You got that completed, it's got a checkbox for checkmark, but it also had errors. And that goes back to something Steve said. What if you have errors? Do you just fail? Do you keep going? There's an opportunity to do that. Um, and then if you were to click on that, one of those links, then it would take you to the logs themselves. Okay, so say you click on that one, and you see what came out. Um, so this is like a detailed view of that last screen that we were at, where you're actually looking at a specific log. And this is a test, so it doesn't do a whole lot. It's just counting sheep, as you might, uh, if you need to go to sleep. Um, and the good thing is it tells you quite a bit about the actual operation that took place, including what you logged. Um, and you'll notice that it's got a, a pre-batch and a post-batch, so if you want to, like, start that log with some sort of information, end the log with some information, you can do that. Uh, and then, I think I said it in maintenance mode, like that. Yeah, right, right. Um, and then it also then log each of the items that gets processed or, uh, and, and tell you about that process that happened. Um, below that, it will notice errors. So say you actually run into errors. Um, it will log out those errors. So be able to see what they are. You don't have to go through well, try, try to find it. Um, and the good thing is, too, it not only shows you what you did, where you did it, how many items that process, but even like how much memory was being used in the process. Uh, so it's, it's a very robust system, uh, but I don't think overly so. I think it basically provides you everything you want, where you run these. Okay, so we run into this at the VA, running big processes. Uh, in fact, one of the things we ran into once was we were thinking we were going to run something through a like, hook up to A or post deploy, and we ran into this issue of it being so big it kept timing out. Um, so, should you have something that continues to do that and you decide you need to run it as a script instead, we, we decided we wanted to use just to run it, but we kept running into the issue of starting at the beginning. Well, that was going to be a problem. So when Steve introduced state, that allowed us to basically start where we left off. Um, we 
which was critical because then even if something kind of we, we went past the, the window of operation, then we could start the next time at the same spot where we just left off. Um, and then it will also show you how far you got, which is great. Okay, so um, I think, is it here? There you go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so you'll notice that it actually tells you where that previous one went to. So it's not just like, hey, don't worry, I'm sorry, we got topics. This is exactly where it started now on this one. Um, so it's telling you, it's telling you what it's doing pretty much the whole time. So there's never a doubt. Um, and you can see each of the runs, how far it got, if it didn't get away. The other thing we wanted to build in is flexibility again. We wanted to, to be able to run a batch operation in many different ways, whatever was appropriate. So first we've got the UI. Again, this is an optional sub-module where you can turn it on and enable it, uh, or leave it off. Um, but one of the ways is to run it through the UI. And so this is an example of the UI. Once you go into a specific batch operation, it gives you information about what the title of the operation is, a sort of longer form description, which is a great place to like link the issue that created this operation in the first place. So you have that sort of historical record. Uh, and here's where we, uh, you know, you get information about is it set to run on prom, uh, how many items is it going to process when it runs, uh, and also, how do we want to run it? And by how, I mean, do we want it to fail gracefully and keep going? Do we want it to uh, fail loudly and stop where it is? This is, this is your option. Uh, again, during development, I might choose the fail on error and no process, so I can go fix whatever's broken. When I run it for real on prod, I want to keep going. We can run it on prom. So I used to work on a site, visit PA. Every February 2nd, I had to wake up at like 7 o'clock in the morning and post a live stream of a marvel. No, it was a ground car. And a weasel. <laughs> and I kind of grew like not like Groundhog's Day. Because also I saw the behind the scenes how fake it is. They reach in and grab this poor thing. But anyway, um, so I could have had a script that runs on Cron every February 2nd after 8 o'clock it could pop up the, the uh, block that would show the live key. Right? Turns out, Marmots, ground bugs, actually like fireworks, so we might also want to have it pop up on the 21st or 4th of July. Right? So we can have something run on front. Notice that they're using actual language and not a bunch of like characters, string of digits to tell you when something runs that you need to decode. Right? It, it understands all of these patterns. And it understands multiple of them, so you can stack them up if you want something to run on the tenth day after sixteen, uh, after ten or ten days after you know four o'clock in the afternoon. You can do that if you want to run every two years. You can do that. You can do both. Right? You, can do, you can stack them up as needed. Uh, you can run it using brush command. Right? So a pretty simple command: brush put batch operations run, and then the name of the, the script uh, the batch operation that you're running. And it'll give you some nice pretty output, but it will still put it into the actual log entity. You can also run it with a hook. So this could be a hook up the end, it could be a post-deploy hook, it could be uh, any number of you know, possibilities, uh, commands to, to run these. And it's a pretty simple uh, two lines of code. And you don't have to remember it, it's on the cover of the module page. Right. That same code, you can also run in your own custom code. So if you've got a submit handler, it can run it. If you've got an event subscriber, it can run it. Uh, so again, it provides like infinite flexibility if there is such a thing. Uh, and the UI lets us see all the scripts that are available. All right, so here's a list of three of them, our test scripts. Uh, and we can see when they were last run, who ran them, what were they run by, so whether it was the UI or PRON, uh, which show up in this list, we can see what's completed. And this is how you get in to actually run them. So if you click on the link for the operation itself, that would take you to the UI where you can choose how to run it. So who's going to run this? Who's going to do this stuff? Well, it does have a permission structure as well. 
So whether you want to determine who sets up the settings, like perhaps your developer, that could be one permission. On the other hand, who is going to actually run these uh, and view these? Uh, you might want someone that can view them that is like a product owner, which makes a lot of sense. They can look at what actually happened, whereas you only want a developer or a Drupal admin to be able to actually execute them. Uh, and then lastly, deleting those logs. Again, that could be something that you will need to provide to either a developer or a DevOps person to determine whether or not that, that's something that persists beyond you know, a month or two. So we're going to walk through like, how to create this. It's been very uh, sort of up in the air right now. Oh, we can do all these things, but now I'll actually show you how. So first thing would be to install the coded batch, op batch operations module. So that would go into contrib. And then uh, find your custom module, whatever, whether you want to create a new one for it or just take back on an existing custom module. So for now, we'll call it your module. Uh, in that, you're going to find or create an SRC directory, just so this can run. And you're going to create a CDO scripts. Something's not showing on this. Uh, in the contrib module, there's a starter script, a sample file that is a starter script that pretty much walks you through over all a lot of the possibilities. So we're going to copy this, move it to CDO scripts change its name to something meaningful, so the example we're using is blanking out the COVID status on 150 facility, uh, healthcare facilities. Then you're gonna open that file, and we're going to uh, rename it, right? So that the namespace is for your module. We're gonna name the class, right? So a starter script is gonna be uh, like a COVID status. Starter script becomes the name of that Right, again, this has to match the file name that you just renamed to. This function already exists, this method already exists. So we're just going to like change what the output of this, of this method is. Okay. We're going to enter a longer description to make it meaningful. Again, a uh, uh, breadcrumb for our future selves. But what did the script actually do when we wrote it? Here's where the sort of meat and data starts, starts coming along. Right? This is where you would do whatever it is you need to gather the items that you're going to work on. So your any query, whatever it happens to be, however you're going to gather the entities, whether they're menus or uh, nodes, this is just where you would do that. All right? So in this particular example, uh, we're just grabbing all the nodes of, that are published. Uh, with a bundle name of facility. Okay. Then we're going to tell it how to process just one of them. We're not going to have to, have to make you worry about, well, how do I loop through all these? Not the loops are complicated, but the logging of loops is complicated. So we're just going to take that out and say, how would you do one thing? So this one, uh, we're not going to get too hung up in the details here, but uh, uh, up here, uh, we're just going to uh, make sure that we go through all the, the current, the, the default revision, and if there are any drafts that are out ahead of that that just haven't been published yet, we want to make sure we alter those too, so that when somebody publishes a draft they already have, they are releasing like an old version. Uh, so we have a little helper function, get go to default and form revisions. That returns revisions. We're going to loop through those revisions. We're going to set field code status to null. We're going to uh, just return a message. Uh, uh, well, sorry, the, the log message goes is the actual revision log, so that's what appears on the node. Uh, and that function actually allows the, uh, the opportunity to just resave that same revision or create a new revision. Uh, so that's one of the flags on that same node revision. And then at the end of processing one, we're just going to return a message about what that one operation did to what. You can make it as, as specific or as generic as you want. I encourage specificity. It helps your future selves. Should it run more than once? This is that identifiance thing. Uh, if it should only be allowed to run on a piece of content once, this returns true. If it 
shouldn't be allowed to run around saying it's identity, you can run it many times and get the same result, uh, you can return false there. And if uh, you, know, you didn't want to include this, you don't have to, this one's actually optional. Right, so that's it. We've just created a batch operation. It's all ready to run by any of these methods. Right, so. Uh, let's, let's run it. Yeah, let's run it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we're going to set up the module first. So we go to the setup page. We're going to put it in the location where it is for us. Uh, which happened to be a good that back end. We had a migrate user uh, ID so that it would run as time went, so that people could tell it was a bot and it wasn't running as me. Although I think some people think it was a bot. Right. And then we're going to come back here and we're going to go to the batch operation that we just created. It now shows up in this list, indicates that's been run. So now we come here, verify, yeah, this is the one we want to run, tells me it's going to run on 48 items. And yeah, I'm going to run it now. It runs like a batch, just in case you haven't seen the batch progress bar. And there, now we have a log for it that appears just below it. So if we want to see what it actually did, we can go into the log. It tells me how long it took. So I know sort of what to expect for future runs if I'm doing this locally. Right? I know if it took one second locally, it's probably going to take that long to run some results. Here's the log itself of what it did, or at least the partial log, it can all fit on the screen. Right? Here's the rest of the log, it tells me that it found them all, there were no errors. Yeah. That's what you really do. <laughs> all right, how do I see all the logs? So the screen that we were just on showed the logs for just that batch operation. Maybe I'm a person that doesn't have permission to run the batch operation, so I wouldn't be able to see that. But we have a different permission for being able to see all the logs of all the things that have been run. Essentially a view, a list of logs. Uh, but it gives us some, some helpful information there. And by clicking any of these, if you've got permissions to see the log, you can click on the link and go to the logs for any given run. Uh, and does anything get log and watchdog? Right? That's kind of a moaning, overwhelming log and watchdog. Well, here you can see for uh, some of these, what got actually logged to watchdog. Just that the thing ran. Right? And the nice part is, in the right hand side, there's a link to the actual batch operation log, so you can go see what actually happened. But there's just this little marker for it in the watch dog. So our dog is happy. <laughs> Any questions? And I'm going to run the microphone so uh, Do you have helper functions for users instead of nodes and profiles? And also, is there a way to, if, if when you're developing, you just want to stop that one so you're not going to get one element? Uh, there's not a stop at one. You can build in a stop just by calling a function that doesn't exist, and it'll, it'll fail. You just choose to like have a stop after the first failure. Uh, it would be a nice, uh, nice addition when they know to, to be able to run just one to test it. Uh, sorry, I forgot what your first question was. Uh, there's a couple of functions for users, mainly around switching users, like if you want to change users. Yes, there are some helper functions for running things on users too. Not as many. Nodes are, are definitely more sort of generic in terms of the, the typical processes that you want to do. Uh, there aren't too many helper functions for users, but we're always open to contributions. Other questions? You could, if you've got functions in that module that you want to use, they can be called during process one. Uh, yeah, you know, depends what else can be mapped over, but sure, lots of things can be replaced with this. Uh, yeah, when we used it, uh, it was, the process one called a much bigger script. I mean, we did some of the process one, but then we had this really kind of giant script. 
Guillermo me gave us a rather slow one, but he also did a rather nervous moving a bunch of paragraphs, a moving a bunch of note information into paragraphs. That was a much more involved process, and so process one did a little bit to get those in and to kind of then call that really large uh, other scrap. So you could definitely expand what you end up using and uh, what else you end up using as part of this. So, uh, thanks for the demo presentation, wonderful stuff. Um, at scale, you must have run this in cron. No or yes? Sorry. Like, you showed us 48 items. Okay, three seconds of processing. What about when there's 100,000 items? So, we ran it on 16,000? 16,000, but the process was very intensive. Maybe an hour. It, it took quite a while, yeah. So you had, your, you had your bash window open for all that time? No, that we actually did the shape of the brush. Right. But it could have been done as a batch and you just leave the bash open. So then you the bash, so you can move off the bash window and you come back to it and pick up your other off. We have a auto log out of the timer server and then the server time time, excuse me. So it, so it seems like our, our only option for some of this would be with Chrome. Uh, Chrome or bash or just a brush command to run it. Like that's whatever works for you. You can run it. You know whatever method is right for you. Whether it's whether it's Chrome, whether it's uh, any deploy book. You know how, whatever makes sense for your pipeline. There's pretty much an option to do it. Whatever your limitations are. Uh, you know VA we had a limitation where we couldn't run it on an update book because if something in an update book took longer than five minutes, the deploy was considered a failure and it's fun in this. So, like we had to work around that by running after deploy with a brush command. Yeah. Does this uh, leverage any of uh, the like manipulation power of people's migrations or like manipulating data that you would want to change? It does not directly, but if you call anything that's available on migration, like, there's no reason it couldn't. Uh, if you want to leverage that, right? Whatever you want to do in process one, whether it's all the migration, like anything that's possible. But there's nothing specific to migration that's baked in. Is there a way to make something run whenever they have the port, for instance? Whatever they have the port. For the port? Is there a port update? Okay. I think there is, but. You could, you know, essentially do an immense subscriber that looks for a change in that value. Maybe I don't know if you, you know, it's a question of diminishing returns. If you're updating a core, you're going to know you updated your core. Uh, but you know, there's nothing. This can fit can fit into any custom code you also want to write. So, but I don't, you know, there's not a, a hook for a core update that I'm aware of, and there's not really a cron in that for that. But you know, if it was part of your deploy process, oh, we just updated core, run this batch. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.